So I was sent to the customs at Jumruk. Uh, at that, and so I became a customs officer, said you will be studying Sufism through the work of Ibn Arabi. So that was, uh, you can call it a hand of fate. Hegel likes puns, playing on words, and Ibn Arabi loves to do that. So he used this potential of language to express uh, the deeper structures of thought and experience of human beings. Uh, Khomeini uh, corresponded with Gorbachev. Uh, they tried to find a common ground between Islamic civilization and Russian civilization. Both civilizations are very spiritual. The, the events of 1979 were critical. They changed the course of my life and the lives of many other people as well. You cannot remain immune to the influence of Sufism because you plunge into this sea, uh, you navigate that sea and uh, your body becomes permeated with these ideas, with the values. Muraqaba, muhasaba, you examine your soul, you try to understand your motives, as you know in the famous hadith, al-amal bin niyat and they discovered that God is everywhere and uh, everything is a manifestation tajalli, of the uh, divine absolute. So you have to purify yourself to become a, a mirror. And that's what Al-Ghazali says uh, of divine outpourings. And then you receive the knowledge of the universe in its purest form. And that's where Sufis come close to what the Shia says about Batan. Uh, uh, but we have to recognize that Jafar al-Sadiq, the sixth Imam, was definitely a person who began to focus on Batan. He provides the first commentaries about the hidden meaning uh, of, of the Quran. So he drops uh, a, a, a drop of sweetness on their tongue so that they would become addicted to, to feeling the same way. It becomes, God becomes then the focus of all their desires. Divine Absolute has so many potentialities, it manifests uh, so these potentialities in every minute, in every moment. Khalq Jadid, he called, yeah, from the Quran. Uh, so each each moment, God is in a different state. That's what also Hira is. You, you are constantly in quest and you bewilderment uh, in the hopes that eventually you will have the whole picture. One should be constantly in the state of this bewilderment and uh, dash, uh, the surprise, become almost addicted to the expectation of a new, new knowledge, as I say in the article. You get one knowledge, it, it prepares you for the reception of another image of God. So that's why God's taste is uh, different from human taste. And we will never know how he tastes things. His doubt is different in that it produces the universe, which human beings can never, they can never taste that taste. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, nurahibu bikum fi silsilati hiwaratin fikriya wa ma'rifiyya ala qanati hira. In this interview, we are interviewing Dr. Alexander Knish, uh, the professor of Islamic studies at Michigan University in the US. And he's originally from Russia, I guess, and he's talking to us now from Russia. Um, his academic interest is in Islamic mysticism, Quranic studies, and the history of Islamic thought. Uh, he has th several books. Um, so some of his most recent books are Islam in Historical Perspective, Sufism, A New History of Islamic Mysticism, and he is also translated um, Al Risal al Qushayriya fi Al Mittasawuf li Abil Qasim al Qushayri. 
he has several important articles, such as historiography of Sufi studies in the West and in Russia, which requires a whole interview itself. Uh, but today we'll discuss the topics um, that uh, Dr. Nish presented in his interesting article, Tasting, Drinking, and Quenching Thirst, From Mystical Experience to Mystical uh, Gnosiology. Um, and in Arabic, الذوق والشرب والري. So in the beginning, uh, welcome doctor. And uh, before we start talking about the article, uh, tell us more, more about yourself, about your academic interest in Islamic uh, historical studies, and especially your interest in Sufi and mystical studies, how it started and how it developed through, throughout your life or throughout your academic involvement. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, talk show, uh, to this uh, chain of presentation, series of presentations. Um, um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm delighted to speak to you um, about my background and about my research. Um, my research started um, unusually because um, the Soviet Union, as you know, was an unusual country. Uh, things were very different from the way things are in the West or in the Arab world or in the Muslim world as a whole. So um, everything was top down. Um, you were told what to do by the state. Um, I started uh, my uh, academic career as a scholar of Arabic literature, modern Arabic literature, in particularly uh, the works of Najib Mahouz, uh, the great uh, uh, Arab writer, Egyptian writer, uh, who received a Nobel uh, Prize uh, in literature. Um, he was the first Arab author to have been uh, awarded that grant. Uh, and um, so uh, at that time, he was not as famous. He was still alive. And I was uh, asked by my supervisor to study his works. Uh, in particular, Tharthara uh, Paukanil, Alis Wal Kilab, Miramar, and a few other novels. One of the novels was called Ash Shahad. It was a study of a uh, spiritual quest of a person. Uh, that was the first time I discovered some Sufi connections because the person was engaged in a Sufi quest for God and God's blessing and uh, enlightenment. So that was my first exposure. I was in the fourth year uh, of my um, undergraduate studies and then continued at the master's uh, level, also focusing on, on Najib Mahfouz, but not specifically on Sufism. Then I worked in the customs. Um, there was a system in the Soviet Union when after the graduation, because the state had paid all your expenses, you were supposed to, um, to work in a place where you would be sent by the uh, authorities. So I was sent to the customs, al <laughs> uh, that So I became a customs officer and I worked there for three years um, in the Pulkova airport, uh, which was the uh, chief air haven for uh, Leningrad at that time, not St. Petersburg. Um, Leningrad was the name of St. Petersburg under uh, Soviet uh, rule. So uh, once uh, my former teacher, Professor Anas Khalidov, who was a Tatar, a Muslim uh, Hanafi uh, uh, scholar, uh, he called me and said, are you tired of going through the baggage of people uh, in the customs. If you are, then come. Uh, we have a new project. It was 1979, uh, and uh, there were a lot of developments in the Muslim world at that time. First was the Iranian Revolution uh, of 1978, 1979. And then the second event was the Russian uh, Soviet, I would say, invasion of Afghanistan. So, um, the Soviet authorities were 
interested in the potential of Muslims to put up resistance, and they tried to find the ideological, um, the ideological um, foundations on which uh, resistance was based. However, uh, they, uh, they were primarily interested in modern Islam. However, uh, they also discovered that they had no scholars of classical Islam. So, uh, so they created a research group uh, on classical Islam. And I remember I came to, to the office of the director of Institute for Oriental Studies in Leningrad. Uh, who was surrounded by several scholars of uh, Arabic and Islamic studies. And uh, uh, the director asked them, what are the principal fields of Islamic studies? And uh, there were three young men, uh, fresh from, uh, from college. I was working in the customs, but the other two were not. They were just, they had just graduated. <clears throat> and so I was, uh, I was at that meeting and um, uh, the director uh, was told by his colleagues that there are three major fields of Islamic studies, Quranic studies, Hadith studies, and Sufi studies. And uh, uh, the director said to the first person, whose name was Yefim Rizwan, uh, you will study the Quran. Um, and the second was uh, Dmitry Yermakov, you will study Hadith. And then he asked me, do you know anything about Sufism? I said, yeah, I, I had read uh, Najib Mahfouz, so I'm familiar with the concept, but otherwise I have no background. He said, you will be studying Sufism. And then he turned to my uh, future uh, supervisor, Professor Khalidov, and asked him, who is the main figure in Sufism? <laughs> And uh, my supervisor said, Ibn al-Arabi. And he said, you will be studying Sufism through the work of Ibn al-Arabi. So that was, uh, you can call it a hand of fate. Uh, you can call it a coincidence. But that's what happened to me uh, as a young scholar. And I became um, an expert on Sufism from that time on. Uh, very interesting, actually. Um, so you did your bachelor's and master's in a Russian university? In, uh, in Soviet university. Soviet Union was very different from contemporary Russia. Yes, uh, I, uh, uh, Leningrad State University, it's a major uh, Soviet university at that time, uh, alongside Moscow State University, the two major universities, the two major capitals of Russia. Moscow and Leningrad, but Leningrad was renamed, now it's St. Petersburg, and the name of uh, my old university is now Leningrad, St. Petersburg State University. Uh, and there were people there who taught you Arabic language? Yeah, uh, we had a very strong Arabic program um, that uh, was established already in the uh, second half of the 19th century. Uh, it was, um, <clears throat> a, has a very rich history. Uh, you may have heard the name of Professor Ignaty Krachkovsky, who was one of the greatest scholars of Arabic literature and the Arabic uh, bell letter, al um, And uh, he was just one of the many uh, Arabists in, uh, on the banks of Niva River where uh, St. Petersburg and Leningrad were, was located. So I'm heir to that old uh, Arabist tradition uh, that began with uh, Rosen, uh, Professor uh, Rosen, a German-Russian scholar, uh, Girgas, uh, uh, Krachkovsky, uh, Mednikov, and many other uh, distinguished Arabists. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting that you mentioned that uh, your first uh, influence was um, uh, by Najib Mahfouz um, uh, and Arabic literature. Um, so you believe that uh, such kind of literature, especially Najib Mahfouz, has also spiritual and deep mystical dimensions also? Yeah, absolutely. If you read Najib Mahfouz, he used uh, Ramzi and uh, symbolism, and he uses many uh, 
Sufi symbols and Sufi allusions, isharat, <laughs> you can, uh, so, uh, but definitely he's also permeated by Western ideas, by existentialism, al um, And uh, so it's a very, Najib represents a very interesting mixture of Eastern and Islamic thought uh, and Western uh, philosophical thought, uh, Sartre, Simon de Beauvoir and uh, other existentialists, uh, Camus and so forth. So uh, that's why I found uh, my study of Najib Mahfouz very rewarding. I learned about Islamic culture on the one hand in his Aulad Haritna, for instance. Uh, and I also learned a lot about um, Western uh, philosophical ideas, structuralism, uh, existentialism um, and uh, other philosophical trends in you know, Western uh, stu <clears throat> study, <clears throat> humanitarian study. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because um, even in uh, some of the modern studies and especially the comparative mystical studies when they uh, approach um, the existentialist uh, philosophy, especially with, with Heidegger, they find, they, they find similarities with the Irvani doctrine in Islam and Heidegger or, or as other existentialists. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, for instance, when you read Hegel, Hegel likes puns, playing on words, and Ibn Arabi loves to do that. Uh, he says, wujud, it's the being, but also finding, uh, so he plays on the root meaning of the words. But Ibn Arabi, mind you, is much earlier. So he precedes Hegel uh, by uh, several centuries, by uh, five, six centuries. So, uh, so he used this potential of language to express uh, the deeper structures of thought and experience of human beings uh, um, very early on uh, in Islamic, within the context of the Islamic culture. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and uh, you mentioned wujud, so he relates wujud with wajd and wujdan, as you know. Yeah, tawajud, wujud, tawajud, ecstasy, uh, ecstatic experiences, uh, trance, uh, uh, and uh, mystical trance. Yeah, he uses, uh, he plays on words. He says, minhaj, minhaja, <laughs> for instance. Uh, so he, he loves uh, playing with language, which he knows so well. Mm -hmm. And we'll delve more in, uh, in the idea of Dawq, which you presented in your article. But uh, in the introduction also, you mentioned, as a historian, uh, you mentioned the Islamic um, revolution that happened in Iran in, in 79. So, uh, there were effects and influences also on people who are studying um, Islam or Sufism uh, from the uh, incidents that happened the Islamic Revolution, especially that uh, also the revolution has its um, uh, mystical and Sufi roots also in the thoughts of uh, some of its leaders, maybe. Yeah, uh, Khomeini uh, corresponded with Gorbachev. Uh, they tried to find a common ground between Islamic civilization and Russian civilization. Both civilizations are very spiritual, and I would say both are very impracticable, <laughs> impractical, rather, um, unlike the West, which is very uh, pragmatic. So, uh, so there were, was a correspondence uh, between these two great leaders, uh, about the potential for reconciliation between the Muslim world on the basis of Rouhaniya, on the spirituality. Uh, and um, uh, as for the influence of Iranian revolution, the Iranian revolution and the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan showed Russia that they, uh, the Soviet Union, I would say, that they know very little about Islam and uh, Therefore, they are completely in the dark why Muslims resist, uh, for instance, why they resist the Shah, why they decided to overthrow a darling of uh, America uh, who was engaged in very wide-ranging reforms called the White Revolution. Uh, and uh, 
they didn't understand why the Mujahideen in uh, Afghanistan were putting up such a fierce resistance, what motivated them. So that's, uh, so my career is in part influenced by these developments because otherwise I would have become a historian of Arabic literature, al primarily, and um, maybe a customs office, I don't know. But uh, the, the events of 1979 were critical. They changed the course of my life and the lives of many other people as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, great. And uh, you mentioned, uh, um, uh, I, I was reading that uh, there, is a, there was a letter that Khomeini sent to Gorbachev also, and he mentioned uh, several points there. And one of the points that he mentioned that um, we, we'd like to invent some of, uh, we'd like to invite some of your most uh, intellectual and academic uh, people to come uh, to Iran to study Ibn Arabi's uh, philosophy, to study the, um, some of the mystical and uh, Sufi masters philosophy, such as Ibn Sina and Ibn Arabi and maybe Sahrawardi also. So I found it interesting. I don't know if you've read this letter. Yeah, I read the letter I wrote to, <laughs> to the Iranian government and, said, and offered <laughs> to come and study in, in Iran, but I never received an answer to that letter, unfortunately. Uh, I only traveled to Iran um, two years ago uh, to receive a prize for my book uh, from, um, uh, fr from, uh, from the leader of the uh, Iranian Republic, Rouhani. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, um, uh, there was a, a, a real um, uh, answer to the to such a letter, where or or such an um, interaction between uh, Russian ac academics and Iranian academics to come and study or to share uh, ideas. Uh, or, or no, no, the letter had no consequences. As I as I told you, I wrote, received no response. Uh, but later on, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were many uh, Iranian cultural centers. Uh, they were established in uh, new Russia, uh, and they have been very active. Uh, there's a, a foundation called uh, Ibn Sina Foundation, for instance, in Moscow. There are cultural centers in provincial cities uh, of Russia. So Iran has been quite active in disseminating its culture, including Sufi-based culture, including poetry, which is, you know, uh, Rumi, Hafez, uh, and uh, Jami. Uh, it's permeated by Sufi symbol, symbols. So, yeah, Iran is interested in uh, disseminating its version of Islamic culture uh, in, in Russia, and there are even uh, converts, uh, Russian converts uh, to uh, Shi Islam um, with names like Abdul Qadir Chernyanka and very strange to the Russian ear. But yeah, that's, uh, that's a widespread phenomenon um, today. There are, of course, also uh, other uh, cultural, Arab cultural centers, which are active, Tunisians, for instance. In, uh, in Russia, they have a, a center. Turk, Turks also had uh, a very robust presence um, before and after the Gulen uh, debacle. Uh, and uh, there are official uh, centers for uh, studies of Turkish culture in provincial cities, such as Rostov on the Don in South Russia, my, one of my colleagues is head of that uh, cultural, uh, Russian cultural center. There is also Russian centers in Istanbul for dissemination of uh, Russian culture among Turks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, um, so, Doctor, my final question will, uh, in this uh, interesting introduction will be, um, uh, the academics normally when they study an issue, uh, for example, Islam or Sufism, uh, academics uh, are outsiders and or historians. Um, but actually when engaging with uh, such um, knowledge, um, does it um, keep an effect or influence on, on a person's spiritual understanding of life or his ethical paths in life or in his own understanding of the main questions of existence? 
yeah, definitely. You cannot remain immune to the influence of Sufism because you plunge into this sea. Uh, you navigate that sea and uh, your body becomes permeated with these ideas, with the values. For instance, in my own personal life, I practice many Sufi values. One of them is tawakkul. Um, um, another is riba, uh, that is satisfaction with your current condition, regardless of whether these conditions are adverse or favorable. Uh, I also uh, try to practice him um, to st- not to get angry at people. So uh, I'm educated. Uh, I study Sufism, but I uh, receive a lot of education from the texts and teachers whose works I study. So yes, there's, it's a t- two-way process. You become influenced. You do not necessarily become a Sufi, uh, but you become Sufi-like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very interesting. So, so, Doctor, during your long study in Sufism and mysticism, um, which uh, theme, or uh, rather theoretically or practically, uh, you believe that it's, it's a very important and central theme or, or a theme that affected your life, other than the three um, attributes that you mentioned now ethically, a theme uh, that you recall from all Ibn Arabi's doctrine or Sufi doctrine that you, you feel it's, it's a very important uh, so there's Sufi practice, uh, Sufi stations, how you reach God, and uh, definitely all these stations are important. Um, your your uh, journey to God begins with Tawbah. At Tawbah, you repent, then uh, you turn to Azuhd fi dunya, you turn ag- against the world, you turn your back on the world, and uh, then you begin to engage in muraqaba, muhasaba, you examine your soul, you try to understand your motives, as you know in the famous hadith, al-amal bin niyat, so you try to understand what is the niyat, uh, your real niyat. So Sufi psychology and Sufi idea of the path is very important. It leads to different uh, goals, because the ultimate goals are described by Sufis uh, differently because they had different experiences. Some say it's al-yaqeen, ayn al-yaqeen, haqq al-yaqeen. Others say it's uh, fana, um, uh, fana fi Allah ta'ala. Um, others say it's baqa, ma Allah ta'ala. So uh, then others say it's haqiqa, al al uh, Still others say it's mushahada, uh, uh, that is direct vision of God. So uh, these concepts are central. But then we also have alongside practical aspects, how you reach God, what you experience, al-ahwal wal You also uh, have an, a different, a special idea of the universe, how the structure, how the universe is structured, how it originated. It's called metaphys- metaphysics in, in, uh, in English uh, and in Latin, of course, um, and in Greek. But um, you can call it a Sufi philosophy. Uh, in Arabic, we may say that it is a ru'ya al kawniya or a ru'ya al wujudiya. Yes, yes. It's um, yeah, world outlook. Uh, So, yes, uh, it's a comprehensive vision of the universe. So practical and metaphysical aspects coexist. And I discuss it in my um, article on a dhawk or a shurb wari. Mm-hmm. Good. So we'll delve more in this article, particularly uh, to discover some of the um, beauties that you presented here. So Sufis used those terms, which are a dhawq, a shurb, a ray, a sakr. They are all related to the issue of uh, drinking, uh, because if a person is th- thirst, so he goes towards drinking. But this is in the materialistic side of it, and they apply to the spiritual side of life. 
Um, so from maybe from the fifth um, century of the Islamic uh, centuries, uh, Sufis started talking about uh, such experiences and it was basically uh, their own mystical and spiritual experiences which they witnessed with divine realities and with God. But then later and especially with the school of Ibn Arabi, um, uh, these concepts took a metaphysical form where they were constru constructed uh, philosophically. So in the beginning, how we can approach um, this idea? So, uh, I, I'm not the first to say that because the French scholar uh, Louis Massillon, uh, who died in 1962, he was a great admirer of uh, the Sufi martyr Hussein ibn Mansur al Hallaj. He dedicated his whole life to the study of his experience, and he thought that Hallaj's experience was the acme, the highest point. Uh, of uh, Sufi uh, experience. And he looked down upon later Sufis who were interested in metaphysics, in the structure and origin of the cosmos, of the universe, um, because uh, he thought that their thought was artificial and divorced, detached from the authentic mystical experience which he associated with Al-Hallaj and other people like um, uh, Abu Hussein al-Muri, um, uh, then uh, Ash-Shibli, uh, Al-Muhasibi, uh, al, uh, al junaid to some extent also. Uh, so when he compared Sufi metaphysics and uh, Sufi uh, experience, he thought, he, dis he decided that metaphysics is uh, artificial and it is simply a borrowing from Neoplatonism. So it's not authentic. It's not authentic to uh, Arabic Islamic thought because he thought that the entire uh, tasawwuf, the Sufism, can be derived from the Quran without reference to outside sources. That was his idea of the Quranic origins of uh, Sufism. And he thought that by borrowing from other cultures, from Hellenistic cultures, from Neoplatonism, uh, Mus uh, Muslim uh, thinkers such as Ibn Arabi, Asura Wardi, and others, they compromise the original experience of Sufism. Uh, you can agree or disagree with that, but I became interested in, in that uh, dichotomy after reading uh, Massignon's study. He was a great scholar and he definitely influenced me and I started to polemicize with him because I believed that mystical experience and mystical vision of the universe are very closely related um, because... Mm -hmm. Sufis have to understand their place in the world, not just their personal experience. They have to make sense of why they're experiencing the things they are. And they discovered that God is everywhere and uh, everything is a manifestation, tajalli, of the uh, divine absolute. al haqiqa al-mutlaqa for uh, or al-haq. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually Sufis, they started witnessing these realities, yushahiduna, or it were unveiled for their hearts, and then when they uh, went through these experiences, th they came back and they wanted to express it and to uh, present it for other people and to share this knowledge for, the, for other people. Thus, they cons constructed uh, philosophical uh, theories and ideas, and then it developed uh, by time and history. And uh, maybe we'll delve more in, in our second interview about the history of, of Sufism about this issue. So it is more um, taken or sourced from the Quran and Sunnah, or no, it's more taken from the maybe Eastern philosophies and religions, or it's a, it's a combination of both, and we can analyze the, uh, this issue in depth there. But, uh, but now also you quote in this article from Ibn Arabi that there are knowledges of tasting that are neither communicated nor told. So, so in the beginning, it's talking about the essence of uh, this knowledge. So no one knows them, but he who tasted them. 
لن تعرف او لن تؤمن حتى ترى او حتى تذوق وي سي ان عربي سو اتس نوت ويذن ذا رايم اوف بوسيبيليتي فور هيم هو هاف تيستد ذيم تو كونفي ذيم تو هيم هو هاف نوت تيستد ذيم سو از اف ذير از نو ا واي اور ا بريدج اوف كوميونيكيشن So in the in the beginning, let us talk about the reality of um, tasting, and then you you talk about the relation between taste uh, and uh, sema and the secret and the meaning uh, and the purity. So the, there is five terms which are related together: the purity of the heart, and then uh, tasting and reaching to the meaning and uh, uh, sema. So in the beginning, let us uh, understand more in depth this uh, reality. So uh, Sufi experience, Sufis experience, as I say, uh, realities which they call haqqaiq. They believe that they experience the true state of affairs in the universe. Then uh, the next step is to put it in the cosmological context, right? To try, as I said, to understand why they have this experience. And then you cannot do without metaphysics. You have to create a comprehensive vision of reality in order to place your personal, very individual experience into a particular uh, context. So that's how, in other words, contrary to what Massignon says, Sufis couldn't have done without creating metaphysics because mutakallimun, uh, they had their own vision of the world. It's jawahir wa arad, yeah, the uh, atoms and their accidents. Uh, then philosophers had their own view of the world. Sufis had to develop their own view of the world. In developing this world, they took some ideas from Mutakallimun and also from Falasifa. Uh, but they created something that is uniquely Sufi because of this idea of immediate experience. Dhawq, um, uh, Mushahada, uh, Muraqaba, uh, they uh, want the Sufis, actually every group wants its methods of understanding of the universe and human beings and God to be superior to others. So Sufis said our ideas are better because they uh, are not just uh, abstract ideas. They are supported by our experiences and by our riyadat, spiritual exercises, mujahadat. So you have to purify yourself to become a, a mirror, and that's what Al-Ghazali says, uh, of divine outpourings. And then you receive the knowledge of the universe in its purest form that surpasses the powers of reason, surpasses the uh, also transmitted knowledge. In other, it surpasses in Arabic, al-aql wa naql. It's better than both. Uh, and of course, uh, scholars, ulama and fuqaha were not happy with that. They didn't want to occupy second position. That's why they, there was an opposition to Sufis because they claimed uh, access to truths that other groups, fuqaha, muhaddithun, mutakallimun, didn't have. So that was uh, a major uh, source of disagreement between Sufis and other uh, uh, religious specialists. And Sufis uh, said that uh, dhawq, uh, tasting, uh, mushahada, direct witnessing, allow them to see uh, the truth of things uh, behind the uh, zawahir, right? They, abstracted themselves from appearances and went to the bottom. And that's where Sufis come close to what the Shia says about bottom. Uh, so they also fo focus on the secret, hidden aspects of the revelation that uh, only people possessed of special insight, which is in Arabic called al-Basira, uh, can discover. If you don't have a basira, uh, then you won't be able to see the bottom. Uh, she's thought that their imams were awliya. Sufis thought that their uh, teachers, shuyukh, were awliya. They used the same word, but they meant different things. In Shiism, 
uh, Basira is genealogically transmitted. In uh, Sunnism, it is acquired through your own riyadat, mujahadat, your own efforts to purify your soul and to make your heart receptive to divine uh, outpourings, tajalliyat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think th this is a question that's related to the history of Sufism, but you may give a, a short answer as a summary. So you believe also that Shiism and Sufism has very great deep connections as some as scholars also believe when they compare between the both the doctrines and they see that uh, the commonalities are great. It's a dangerous question <laughs> because you don't want to compromise Sufism in the eyes of Sunnis, especially to give ammunition to a Salafiyya. Uh, who would say that Sufism is a Shi, uh, disguised Shi influence in Sunni Islam. Uh, but we have to recognize that Jafar as Sadiq, the sixth Imam, was definitely a person who began to focus on bottom. He provides the first commentaries about the hidden meaning uh, of, of the Quran. But he was surrounded by people who were uh, pro alid those who supported Ahl al-Bayt, and also people who, were, uh, who liked the, uh, the uh, Ashraf, uh, the Sayyids, but who remained Sunni on, in ideologically. Uh, so from his circle, these two strains of... Uh, uh, piety emerged, two strains of mm, mystical thinking. One went to the uh, Shi Islam, first to uh, uh, mostly to uh, the Isna Ashariya, the 12 Shis, but also to Ismailiya. They both emphasized Batan and Ismailiya. You know, there are many different groups, but they all are fascinated by the Batan. And then the, in the Sunni world, the uh, Sufi awliya also emphasized botan and also claimed that the knowledge of botan sets them apart from the others because uh, people just slide on the surface. They don't see the realities of things that they see through their hearts. Their hearts are polished. They receive the most accurate knowledge from a uh, divine source and therefore they can see through people they can see their true intentions just looking at their uh, face um, whereas muhaddithun mutakallimun and philosopher cannot do that because they are confined only to uh, traditional knowledge or to the akliya to the intellectual vision of the world mm -hmm. so um, so I, I didn't answer your question deliberately because, yes, there are common uh, commonalities between Sufi and Shi thought. And uh, some scholars, such as Henri Corbin, the French scholar, emphasized that there are three es um, esoteric traditions in Islam, uh, uh, Ismailism, Twelve uh, Shiism, and Sufism, and they should be studied together regardless of the differences. And then those who say, no, uh, Sufism is more democratic. It allows any person without, the, uh, uh, without uh, genealogy, uh, going back to the prophet, to experience uh, the botan, to, to, to reach the haqqaiq of the world through purification of their soul, tazkiyat al nafs. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is actually what I meant uh, by my question that uh, uh, some scholars find um, uh, deep similarities between Shiism and Sufism, not in the sense of secular approach, um, uh, sectarian approach or ideological approach or the madhahib and firaq and tayyarat al-ideology, but in the sense that the people who are seeking to reach to God uh, from very deep spiritual experiences um, uh, and awliya and uh, uh, Asfiya and Siddiqeen, this was manifested in the 12 uh, Imams of Ahl al-Bayt and also was manifested in great uh, Sufi scholars or all over the history. 
and the Sufi scholars, we find them either they are um, the sons of Ahlul Bayt or uh, either they take their knowledge from Ahlul Bayt. So uh, from this uh, uh, point of view, we can see similarities. And then the path is also, also open for all uh, seekers. Uh, who wants to reach this path, path whether we called it uh, Sufism or Shiism or Esotericism or Botanism. <laughs> I don't know Botanism. Is not. So uh, this is my question in, in similarities. I don't know if you, you have a comment here. Uh, could you repeat your question? I did quite. So you, you, you say, I think I answered your question. I, uh, I mean, the similarities are in the essence when we study yeah. both uh, traditions. Sufism or Shiism? I would say uh, similarities are clear in uh, also on the level of approach to, to the Quran. Shis look for the bottom in the Quran. Uh, they, how do they extract the bottom? It's still bot, it's called. Uh, they use ta'awil, right? Ta'awil. Uh, Sufis also do the same, but and they also use ta'awil, but sometimes they look for different things. Sufis are looking for spiritual aspects of botan. Uh, Shi'is are more interested in political aspects, the special role of the Imams, al right? So they are looking to references to the special role of Ahl al uh, su Sufis are not interested. They are more interested in the spirituality in, that resonates with their internal states ahwal so they are their tawil is uh, devoid of this political aspects that are unique to the ismailis and to the shis so i think if i don't know if i answered your question yeah. but, but also uh, with many sufis especially in the later century centuries we find um, the political and the sufi aspect are linked together when we find the um, uh, fought against the uh, oppressions of the uh, invasions that happened from the West or from the French uh, to the countries like Tunisia and uh, um, Al Maghreb Algeria, or Tunisia, right? Tunisia, these countries. So uh, the, the aspect also is related here. Uh, Sufis, uh, because they be were so influential in the society, Marshall Hodgson, the great American scholar um, from the University of Chicago, who died early. He said that Sufism was the mainstay of social order in pre-modern and early modern Muslim world. And he was right. Sufism, Sufis were everywhere. They, they were Sufi patron saints in every village. In uh, every big city had uh, Sufi tombs, Sufi zawiyas, Sufi khanaqas, Sufi lodges. Uh, Sufis were very important in economic life. They provided services that the state could not provide. They fed the poor. They housed travelers in their hanakas and zawiyas uh, and ribats. So they were very important players. And imagine then an external power appears and threatens all this way of life. Who can mobilize the people? The people who are popular, uh, that is the Sufis, they can mobilize people to resist. And that's why we find very important uh, leaders of a national liberation movement. Abdul Qadr al Jazairi in, in Algeria, who, was, uh, who fought against the French and was captured and sent to exile in Damascus. Or Shamwil, or Shamil is his known in the Arabic sources. His real name is Shamwil, Samuel. Um, and uh, he was uh, uh, the leader of anti-Russian conquest uh, of the forces of the Muslims who defended uh, the North Caucasus from the Russian invasion. Sufis also were active in Central Asia, also resisting the Russian encroaches. But they were even more important and deadly for the British in the Sudan. Um, Mahdi, for instance, uh, and his uh, successors, they killed uh, General Gordon in the Battle of Umdurman. And so Sufis were active, uh, but 
Having said that, Sufis are also very diverse. Some of them chose to cooperate with the French, the Tijaniya, for instance. One group of the Tijaniya became pro-French and became conduits of French policy, colonial policy. The leader of the Tariqa at Tijaniya even married an, a French woman. She became the princess of the Sands, as they called her. So, or in West Africa, there were those Sufis, uh, Muridiya, uh, then uh, also followers of Amadou Bamba, um, uh, that's uh, Muridiya, uh, also Tijaniya. Some sided with the French, others opposed them. So it was, that's what I find very interesting. It's a choice of every sheikh <laughs> to resist or to surrender. Uh, and uh, Sufis could take different positions vis-a-vis -vis the conquerors. But the Salafis of Salafia today, they, they say that they are uniformly pro-colonial. It's not true. There are this uh, remarkable examples of Abdel Qadr al jalai Al Jazari, Al Mahdi, of Sudan, and Omar al Mukhtar in Libya, and others. Omar al Mukhtar, al Sanusiya, yes, all they they resisted the Italians to the last. Uh, Omar Mukhtar was hanged, uh, by, uh, and he was leader of the uh, Sanusiya Tariq. Yeah, and, uh, the French were afraid of Atijaniya. They, there's a the black legend, La yeah. Legend Noir, uh, Atijaniya. Yeah, so different. Mm -hmm. Different regions, different approaches. Mm -hmm. Also, Sufis were active in resisting uh, the Chinese in uh, uh, Uyghuristan, uh, Xinjiang, as the, 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 uh, the Chinese call it. So, mm -hmm. and, and this is more uh, talking about the Sufis and their uh, political and social engagements and their societies. Um, going back to a point you mentioned that Jafar al-Sadiq, which is the sixth uh, Shi'i Imam, uh, he had more uh, uh, concentration on ta'wil and batan and this stuff. So how can we find this in his uh, effort? Maybe in Muzbah um, al you mean in this book that is related to him or also in other uh, sayings and teachings? as uh, collected a very big book called uh, Haqqaiq al-Tafsir. Uh, and in that book, he collected all early sayings about Batin. And the earliest were belong to Jafar al-Sadiq. You can, it constitutes about a hundred pages. If you extract, it's a very vast work. He, he started with Jafar al-Sadiq, Hassan al-Basri, uh, and then he moved to his own age. So he used uh, uh, the, uh, Commentaries by um, Al Junaid, uh, At Tustari, At Tirmizi, and others. Uh, so, but uh, Jafar Sadiq is one of the major source of this saying. So, Hakaik at Tafsir. Uh, there's a short version of it. It's published in uh, in Beirut, uh, in uh, with Arabic text by Professor Bergering. Uh, but the uh, and there are several uncritical editions of this work uh, in Iran and in the Arab world. Professor Bovering wanted to do a critical edition. But he tried to collect all the manuscripts, couldn't find every manuscript. At some point, he stopped. But yes, that's the source of my information about Jafar al-Sadiq, Haqqaiq al-Tafsir li Abi Abdurrahman al-Sulami, who died in uh, 1021. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, going back to Mas'alat uh, al which is uh, interesting. Um, so, you also talk that uh, Abu Nasr al Sarraj in uh, Al Lumar, he uses the imagery of uh, profane uh, wine poetry to describe the immediate presence of God. So, he com compares between, the, between this uh, physical effect of drinking wine and the spiritual intoxication, I think you mean fana, in experience of encountering God. He also uses the term shurb, so as the body drinks water the heart drinks the spiritual pleasure and sweetness. Um, you also mentioned about soccer, drunkness, which causes the mystic to lose the sense of himself and his surroundings, whereas uh, uh, sobriety, I don't know how you translated sobriety, al -hudur, al al -sahu. so al -mahu al -sahu, yeah. uh, sharpens the awareness of himself and the things uh, around him. So 
uh, if you would uh, explain here the idea of uh, shurb and uh, sukkur and its uh, meanings. Yeah, uh, wine imagery, uh, you know that uh, the genre of khamriyat goes back to the pre-Islamic times and it had many exponents. Uh, the most prominent was Abu Nuwas. Uh, Sufis like to quote Abu Nuwas, but they uh, emphasize the spiritual aspects of his poetry. So, uh, yes, if you are close to God, you experience excitement and even trance. They call it tawajid, you said yourself, or mawajid. Uh, and then you lose consciousness. Uh, so they, they compared this process of losing consciousness of oneself and one's surrounding uh, with a uh, drunkenness of an ordinary drunk, drunk with uh, physical wine. Uh, but uh, the wine imagery conveyed this idea of this experience very well, although it went against the Sharia, yes. Some say that Abu Nuwas only used it, it was for him a mana, it was for him just a, a conceit, a literary conceit that he never touched wine. There's a, a work uh, by James Morris, uh, no, J not Jim Morris, uh, James Montgomery, uh, which says that uh, Abu Nuwas was a teetotaler, he, <laughs> he never drank wine. He only used this imagery to convey his experience of life. So Sufis did the same, if, if uh, James Montgomery is true, is correct. Uh, they, they used, they didn't drink necessarily wine. They just felt intoxicated by the, their experiences. And that's why they used wine imagery from the Khamriyat, from the very established genre, to convey uh, their sense of the world, how they are dizzy, how they are lost uh, in, in God when they become oblivious of their surroundings. So that's why it, it, this imagery of wine came in very handy for the, uh, uh, for the transmission of the experience. The same applies to the world love of uh, a woman, right? You, you love God, uh, then you compare your love of God with a love of a earthly, mundane woman, um, you also treat your beloved as a sometimes capricious uh, individual who rejects your, uh, or ta uh, tests your resolve by giving you different tasks. So for, uh, for this reason, love uh, poetry and wine poetry was appropriated by uh, Sufis. I, I have a special article on that uh, about Sufism in Yemen, how this uh, line, how this poetry, love and wine poetry developed in Yemen. Uh, during the uh, early uh, Ottoman period when the Ottomans first conquered uh, Yemen. So I take two poets, Bamahrama and uh, Asuri, and uh, I, I see this imagery of wine and uh, love of, of women uh, everywhere to convey this deeper Sufi uh, experiences. You, you recall an interesting and... example about uh, talking about the woman and symbolizing the love of the woman uh, for loving God. Do you recall, recall an interesting um, maybe verse or, or theme? Uh, yeah, uh, well, Rumi is full of that too, uh, love. Um, Ibn Arabi. Rumi and Attar and the Persian uh, Sufi literature yeah, is full of. Uh, yeah, uh, Jami, Hafez, yeah, uh, Sanai. Uh, in Ibn Arabi, uh, Tarjuman al Ashwak, he loves a concrete Iranian woman called Nizam. Uh, is. is, is is she an invention of his mind or she is a real woman? We don't know. But his poetry describes her in the context of Al Haram al Sharif. So he, she is in Mecca. He observes her and becomes Muwalla. He becomes the, uh, uh, excited with love. Uh, and then, so he, he writes beautiful praises of this woman. 
uh, and then his critics say, oh, he, he actually had an illicit uh, exp uh, experience with that woman. He's not supposed to approach her. He praises a foreign uh, uh, woman uh, uh, in his poetry. He is uh, Zindiq. He is uh, uh, Fasiq. He responds by writing a whole, uh, uh, he, he has a short divan of Tarjuman al Ashwat. He writes now a commentary, which is larger than the poetry itself, in which he explains the spiritual meaning. So then Nizam becomes the structure of the universe. It's, she's not a woman, she's a symbol of the harmony of the universe. Uh, harmony that, it man that is a manifestation of the divine wisdom. So, uh, so you mean he explained all divine realities uh, through the symbolizing it in, in ghazal uh, for a woman? In the ghazal, yes, yes. Uh, you can read it, Tarjuman al-Ashwaq, and you can read it, uh, his commentary. But in his lifetime, he was accused of being a debaucher, <laughs> of being an immoral person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so going back to this uh, theme of uh, drunkness and uh, uh, so I think there they also talk about um, here you mentioned that uh, the Nun al-Masri he says when God um, uh, or when God gives the lovers a drink from the cup of his love he first gave them a taste of its pleasure and a lick of its uh, uh, sweetness so what do you mean by that? He entices people, you know, uh, by giving them just a drop of sweetness, he entices, uh, uh, how to say in, in Arabic, istidraj maybe. <laughs> he wants to, uh, them to become aware of how great this experience of being with God is. So he drops uh, a, a, a drop of sweetness on their tongue so that they would become addicted to, to feeling the same way. It becomes, God becomes then the focus of all their desires to the exclusion of other desires. And uh, they plunge into God as they plunge into the sea. So that's why he says that uh, Thauk is the beginning of that experience. God wants you like, attracts you like if you are a cat you you give some cat a a, a piece of uh, chicken for instance and then the cat follows you because he wants more more chicken i'm sorry for this very mundane image but that's uh, this spiritual uh, intoxication is so exhilarating people get so high they want to repeat it and they begin fo focused on god uh, single-mindedly, single-handedly. That's what uh, he probably means when he talks about shurb, shirb, uh, ri. It's a somatic experience, right? But uh, we crave for certain types of food, and Sufis crave for this spiritual food. They want more, more of it, and eventually they become majdubin they become completely drawn to God and then they may behave uh, erratically like Kalandars did, uh, uh, like Darawish did. Uh, they're holy fools because they are absorbed with God. They lose their mind. Uh, Junaid said, no, it's, you should stop this and go back to the world. It's Baqa. After fun, you have to go back to Baqa. Otherwise, you become a raving mad. Who, uh, uh, who only worries about his own salvation. Mm -hmm. so experience should be for everyone. They should disseminate it because it's great. So the level of um, Baqa is higher from the level of Fana because the level of Fana you yourself are reaching, but now you're taking the, taking the hands of uh, other people also. Or now you can witness the Haqq uh, within the Khalq, not only witnessing the Haqq alone. So you're witnessing a greater Tajalli maybe also. Yeah, you are with God, but in the world. It's called in Persian, Khalwa uh, Daran Juman. Loneliness with God in the crowd, in the society. 
So you are in society. That's what Naqshbandiya do. They, they practice. They go about their business, but they are focused on God and on Rabita with the Sheikh, on, on the connection with the Sheikh. Uh, so Junaid and all sober Sufis thought that Baqa is superior. But there were some, such Hallaj, Kharaqani, Ayn al Qudat al Hamadani, who thought that Fana actually is the, uh, the ultimate experience. So Sufis were not of one mind. They, were, they had different concepts of how one should behave responsibly or irresponsibly, or whether or not or Sufis are allowed to show miracles. It's called Ifsha al karamat uh, uh, Al-Hallaj was accused of that. So uh, Junaid said, you should conceal everything. You should only talk about your experience to the select group of people who have similar experience. You shouldn't disseminate. Halaj went to the streets, to the marketplace, uh, made uh, public miracles, attracted crowds. Junaid didn't like that. Mm-hmm. But even Ayn al and people like Ayn al so he was a Qadi and he was in the interacting socially with people. So even if he believed more in Fana, but he was also uh, actualizing uh, Baqa also and uh, witnessing uh, Haq uh, inside the society. Yes, but he, uh, his ideas that human self is basically divine self, <laughs> that was uh, a dangerous idea. That yourself is the muhtasar, you say, of, 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 of gods, of God. The, your selfhood is the same selfhood as God. Muhammad Rastam talks about that in his very good book. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, I would say Hamadani made many uh, enemies being working with people uh, with the establishment. They used his very um, esoteric ideas against him in order to kill him. He was seen as a rival. So mm-hmm. this similar things happened to Halaj. He He was in the center of attention. He was seen by the viziers as a rebel rouser, a person who can incite people to riot. And therefore, uh, he had to be put away. Mm -hmm. If Sufis remain like a Junaid within their circle and do not disclose their mysteries to the outsiders, they are safe. But Mm -hmm. once they become socially active, they become dangerous for the powers that be. Uh, other yeah. other great mystics also were killed or were um, uh, uh, Uadimu we say in Arabic or, um, like uh, Sahrawardi also for example Sahrawardi, yeah, his ideas uh, again, we always have to take into account uh, the environment um, he was put to death on the orders of Salah ad-Din Salah ad-Din thought that uh, he told his son to execute him uh, he thought that the Muslims should be united. They should not uh, pay attention to dangerous ideas such as those propagate. They, he considered these ideas to be divisive and dangerous. Uh, he wanted the Muslims to unify around one goal, jihad against the Crusaders, uh, as Salabiyin, or at the French, they were called at that time. Uh, so he thought that such... Uh, uh, unusual and exotic individuals uh, are uh, shaking the foundations. Their ideas may be interpreted as unification of all religious beliefs. So then why we are fighting the Christians? <laughs> because we are believing the same basic ideas. Well, it's it's a dangerous we idea. Find, we find the life of prophets also. They came to shake the foundations of society and the taqlid uh, that uh, so m- many of the prophets who are killed for the same reason also. So we can compare like this. Yeah, the charismatic revolution, uh, Max Weber called it. Uh, every prophet brings a charismatic revolution uh, uh, a new law uh, which rejects the previous ways. Jesus rejected Pharisees. Uh, 
uh, Muhammad rejected paganism. Moses uh, rejected also paganism and idolatry. Uh, Abraham did. So uh, Ibrahim also. So yes, these charismatic individuals initiate a charismatic revolution. But what happens later is what is important. The impulse of that revolution dulls, becomes subdued, and it may turn into its opposite. But that's a different story. That's why Tajdi and Mujaddid is needed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, Doctor, you reminded me uh, in talking about the, the issue of fana and shurb and sukkar and uh, this stuff, also uh, about the state of um, perplexity, maqam al hira, because also the uh, Sufis they talk too much about the al hira, and when a person um, uh, feels uh, the great grace of God or the great tajalliyat, so he enters a state of hira. I don't know if you'd like to comment. Well, uh, hira or hira, I, I think both pronunciation are allowed, right? Uh, it's tahayyur also. Uh, it's a state of mind uh, that Ibn Arabi praised because he thought that it, uh, it, the, it is the best instrument to, to catch the constantly changing conditions of the uh, divine absolute. Divine absolute has so many potentialities. It manifests... Uh, uh, these potentialities in every minute, in every moment. Khalq Jadid, he called, yeah, from the Quran. Uh, so each, each moment, God is in a different state. If you think of God as a, like, Mu'tazili, you, know, you think of an abstract entity about which no positive statement can be made. Or if you a muhaddith, you think of God as basically an old man sitting on a cloud or in a throne. Uh, he says this, this ideas of God capture one aspect of God. They are all correct. But Sufi is switching from one to another uh, every moment. And that's why he is a constant state of confusion uh, or bewilderment. Hira uh, or Hira. Because that's the way, best way to keep track of constantly changing uh, modes of existence of the divine absolute. So I think it's a great idea. Makam la makam, you reach a, a state of no state. Uh, it all reflects uh, this dynamic uh, picture of the universe, which we don't find in the Mu'tazili or uh, Ashari or Falsity, so it's you know. not a confusion in, neg in a negative sense, which I'm full of uh, a shack. Uh, no, it's no. totally different. It's an instrument of knowing God, a way of knowing God, keeping with his constantly changing manifestation, the Jaliyat. Like and being overwhelmed of a person that he has uh, too many beauties or too many graces on you? Uh, you become overwhelmed. That's what you are asking. Yeah. yeah, you become overwhelmed because you experience the plenitude of divine uh, glory, of divine uh, uh, potentialities. That's why you feel bewilderment. And that's the best way to be. Uh, if you attach yourself to a particular manifestation, you become stuck with it. And then you begin to judge all other manifestations as wrong. And Ibn Arabi said that even idols reflect certain uh, aspects. Uh, Jumud, for instance, of the absolute. Uh, so you take them as natural manifestation uh, of God. So you can find God in a, uh, I, uh, in a pagan temple, in the church, in uh, Kaaba, uh, and in, in love. Uh, Hazrat, yes, he says in the Ghazaliyat. Uh, so Ibn Arabi says that in the uh, one of uh, the famous poems in Tarjuman al-Ashwaq. Okay, I think we need... To, to the tasting issue. Um, uh, because always we, uh, they, uh, they mention this uh, example, the Sufis, um, tasting honey is not like talking about honey. Um, but then we have this difference between intellectual understanding 
and the knowledge which is gained by witnessing, tasting, shuhud, dhawq, which is idraq qalbi. How to say idraq qalbi in English? It's a, it's, yeah, it's a perception of God through uh, the heart. Yeah, yeah. Or, or they differentiate between the ilm al-husuli, the, the intellectual knowledge, and the ilm uh, al which is knowledge by presence, maybe. Um, so, but, but in comparing, so how we can have a, um, a good evidence or a proof that um, such ilm, ilm al or ilm al is uh, it's, it's a more higher level or it's a powerful level of understanding reality than intellectual or conceptual understanding. So is it something different? Is it another type of um, witnessing? Oh, how can, can we prove that it's, 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 a, it's a higher level of understanding? That's the, pro the problem we cannot prove. For, for those who experience it, it's, it's a given, they take it for granted. Those who uh, reject it, you cannot convince them because they cannot experience that. And they do not try to experience that uh, sense of doubt. They say it's just a, a figment of every person's imagination. So, and uh, when they say that, they're just repeating what the leaders of the European Enlightenment said. That Rational knowledge is the only correct one. But for pre-modern Islam, uh, mystical cognition, right, idrak, uh, existed, uh, was legitimate. Uh, they disagreed over its reality. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah would say it's a personal uh, cognition of every person. It's his fantasy imagination. Uh, Whereas others, like Ibn Arabi, thought that it is the only true knowledge. And uh, these two groups, they never see eye to eye. Um, because like taste, how can you describe the taste of honey? You can say, is it red? <laughs> is it blue? Uh, to a person who doesn't have the experience of tasting of the honey, is it yellow? probably yellow, but it's, it's color, it's not its doubt, right? It's not its taste. So uh, that's, that's what Ibn Arabi constantly repeats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's Interesting that you mentioned a quote from William Chittick in this uh, context, you say that the main concern of Ibn Arabi is not the mental concept of being, rather the experience of God being, tasting, finding of being, and to be what uh, the truly is. Yes, yeah. That's what also Hira is. You, you are constantly in quest and you bewilderment uh, in the hopes that eventually you will have the whole picture. But uh, it is the process that matters, not the final uh, vision. Because when you reach the final vision, Ibn Arabi says somewhere in Al-Futuhat, then all veils are lifted and you see the truth in all its glory. But this only happens after the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and also you mentioned that, um, um, or it's a question that why the seeker of knowledge never experienced quenching a ray uh, in the doctrine of Ibn Arabi, because he's tasting, then he will uh, start drinking. So why he never uh, reaches to the state of ray? Because Al-Haq, Ibn Arabi says, is um, is endless. The potentialities of God are um, inexhaustible. Uh, that's why one person cannot experience uh, all these infinite manifestations of God. God is uh, constantly surprises people by new and new and new and new manifestations. And therefore, uh, to reach the uh, ultimate goal for an individual person is almost impossible. One should be constantly in the state of this bewilderment and uh, dash, uh, the surprise. Uh, when you, uh, you, you, uh, become almost addicted to the expectation of a new new knowledge as i say in the article you get one knowledge it it prepares you for the reception of another 
image of God. And then after you get that image, it prepares, it's a next step to another image. And this is endless, uh, an endless chain of events. I don't know if Ibn Arabi thought that he may have reached that goal of getting a comprehensive picture uh, of al-Haqqiqa or al-Haqq. Um, he seems, sometimes he's difficult to nail down. He says one thing in one po poetic line in his Diwan, and then he says another thing. Uh, so so, so mainly uh, you're stating that the, the, the more you drink, the thirstier you become. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Yeah, I would say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I recall that you also mentioned yeah, that, that, that the heart of a, of a person becomes like an ocean without a, a shore uh, yeah. because uh, it, it starts to discover the realities of the, the unlimited realities that are manifested in the nature and the, the realities of his soul, which is also unlimited. As you mentioned, Ayn al-Quba, the soul is uh, related to the unlimited, nafkha min ruhillah. So it's all related yes. feature, manifestations, and the soul, maybe. You carry in yourself this uh, infinite, infiniteness uh, and uh, all the potential of the universe in your heart, yes. Uh, and uh, yourself is the reflection of the divine self. Uh, uh, which is uh, endless, full of uh, new potentialities and infinite, because God is infinite, according to to the tradition. It it can never exhaust the potentialities invested in it. Mm -hmm. It's like an, a disclosure of the matrix, you can say. <laughs> Uh, you, you also talk about the uniqueness of uh, different bites. Like, for example, you mentioned the example of eating an apple, and you say whenever you, you have a bite, so the different bite will have a different taste. So there is no repetitive taste. Yes, exactly. The taste is always different, unless you use it as a result of the COVID, <laughs> <laughs> of the virus. You know, people lose their uh, sense. Uh, um, of smell of tasting yeah and normally people lose that uh, the taste of uh, tasting uh, realities when they live um uh, so doctor um uh, there is any point also you'd like to mention about the article of tasting drinking uh, being drunk or uh, let us make a small summary of the reality of drinking uh, in the irfani doctrine yeah first of all uh, we need to understand these are allegories right they are uh, they use taste to express something uh, that they experience, but they simply use it for the lack of words because they cannot find something that is uh, unique to an individual person uh, and at the same time universal. So they use dauk, shirp, uh, shurb uh, to convey these ideas. Um, uh, so they are allegories of a special mode of cognition, which Sufis consider to be the most veracious, the most authentic ones. And uh, they just, just oppose this authentic uh, uh, tasting, understanding of realities to the other ways of knowing God and the world. They recognize them as valid, but they consider their uh, way of knowing uh, to be superior. Uh, as a result, they were exposed themselves to criticism for this grandiose uh, statements by Fukaha and Mutakallimin, and of course philosophers who didn't recognize the reality of saintly miracles. Uh, Mutazila also didn't. Um, so, so Sufis used uh, somatic notions, uh, physical notions to convey uh, their uh, experience of the universe. And uh, um, unlike others, which uh, people who used hadith, for instance, as a unit of knowledge, or um, uh, say, jawhar, a conception of atom to structure the universe, uh, to, to convey their understanding of, of the universe, or they used al aql as, as a way of experience, Sufis use Dauk, uh, which they consider to be a su superior mode of uh, understanding and seeing the world. 
and they used it alongside other images like direct witnessing mushahada um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or uh, casual mukashafa also we use. Mm -hmm. I think they have different synonyms, like they say, al-dawq or al-kashf or al-mushahada, al-ilham, al-ilqa, al-tajalli, al-ilm al-basira. Maybe so different terminologies uh, that express the same idea, or each terminology reflects a certain tajalli, maybe, or a certain tajalli of uh, certain names or certain ahwal, because I don't think they use uh, uh, only synonyms just for the sake of. Uh, uh, creating more words. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, so there are many synonyms. I focused on the ones that have to do with sensual perceptions of taste because I found it interesting how they started with the psychological and somatic uh, emotional uh, aspects of a tasting and how gradually it became uh, a metaphysical uh, way of seeing the world or conceptualizing the world. Because God also has a taste, uh, that only God has the taste for creating things that others cannot by definition possess because only God is the maker, the creator. So that's why God's taste is uh, different from human taste. And we will never know how he tastes things. We taste things that already exist. God tastes things that are about to emerge. His God's taste give them independent existence, which we experience through our taste. Uh, but we will never come back, get back, get to, to the very bottom of God's tasting of things because his tastings generate things. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very important point that you mentioned, which differentiates Ibn Arabi's approach to the term dhuq than the uh, past uh, Sufis, where he says that uh, dhuq starts from God when he uh, accomplishes the, this creation. So he also uses the term dhuq uh, on mm -hmm. God uh, attributes also. Exactly. Yeah, I was fascinated by his use. It means he wanted to emphasize the unique uniqueness of God's uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, his his dawk is different in that it produces the universe, which human beings can never, they can never taste that taste. <laughs> and because uh, God's knowledge is from the dawk and shuhud, so a person should try to uh, or through also dawk and uh, this yes. type of knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you also relate, Doctor, the term of dawk um, um, with all different um, states or ahwal or realities that a Sufi grasps. So I, I think you mentioned in your article these terms: al mahu al ithbat, al fana wal baqa, al talwin wal tamkin, al sahu wal mahu, al qabd wal bast, al hayba wal uns, al jam wal farq. So all these uh, different irfani uh, states are related to the uh, reality of dawk. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, you taste ahwal, right? You taste uh, different uh, states of your mind, di different psychological state, right? You, you, for instance, today you, you taste mahu, I am nothing. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, you, and then, or to, then you feel completely lowly and undeserving. Uh, and then you, you awake. Uh, you awake to the plurality and beauty of this world and you feel that you are part of that glorious, beautiful world and you feel good about yourself. So it's tasting different tastes about even within yourself. Or al-qabd um, wal-bast, uh, right? Qabd, you feel squeezed and sad. Uh, uh, very disappointed, and then you experience this uh, bust, right? You you accept the world, and you become filled with that with that world, and uh, you no longer feel the contraction of qabd. You become your soul embraces, encompasses the whole universe, uh, the whole uh, uh, assemblage of divine manifestations. So different, constantly in pairs, uh, despair, 
hopefulness, arraja wal khawf, and so forth. So this uh, pairs need to be studied separately. I mentioned them just for the sake of, and yes, they're connected with dhauq because that's how we taste our own being. It constantly changes taste. Once, uh, like if you, you bite uh, a sour apple and then, then the next moment you bite uh, a sweet apple and the change uh, you experience is dauk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so doctor, such uh, stations are very special to the Sufis who reach to such high, high levels of spirituality or no, they have manifestations according to different hearts of people and different spirits and different levels. So also ordinary people, they can witness such uh, states due to the level that they, uh, they reach. So is it like this? It has many different levels, or no? These these are things that are very special, and for for, for many, it's only for awliya. Sufis say that ahwal, ahwal can visit a beginner, a very lowly person, undeserving person, maybe even a drunkard, uh, because it's a glimpse uh, that may stop him from being a drunkard. So they say that. Ahwal are not confined to the spiritual elite, khusus al khusus. It can be experienced by anyone. But what we make of this experience is important. One person, oh, for instance, it's uh, a hooligan or debaucher, stops doing bad things because God gave, sent him a signal and he took it. Others experience it, oh, well, uh, I'll go on with, with my ways. I will not change my ways. It was uh, something very fleeting and uh, unimportant. So Sufis uh, learned to capture the signals from God and then began to cultivate them. That's what we call, uh, first they experience Ahwal. Uh, once they, they consider them important, they begin to cultivate them. Uh, to try to stabilize them, tamkin in Arabic. Uh, they want them to be stable and they become maqamat. Right? So uh, ahwal is uh, democratic. Anyone can experience. What the person makes of this is different. One just forgets about it the next moment and goes about his business. The other person wants to, again, experience it to... Uh, to, to make this tamkin, to stabilize them and want them to make a permanent uh, station. And then he experienced another hal and uh, wants to uh, nail it down, uh, stabilize it and uh, move on to the next maqam. So you see maqams and the ahwal are closely... That's why related. they say ahwal asalikin wa maqamat al-arifin. So they differentiate between uh, the two. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's a sort of signals from God for for different people, and even signals of God they have a, it has levels. So, well, what do they say? The heart of knowledge they have a higher hearts than a normal yes. heart. A, a ripe, uh, the yeah. ripe heart. Yeah. Yes, the ripeness. But uh, what is interesting about Sufism, and we have many stories in Al Qushayri's Risal Al Qushayri, the Alim Al Tasawwuf. He says a lot about people who are despised by everyone, but who are God's friends, including effeminate people. Uh, so he, he says that God works in unpredictable ways. People whom everyone despises may be God's friends, but they're hidden. Uh, Ibn Arabi said that the Qudb he met uh, in North Africa was ala shal, he had a paralyzed hand. Uh, and no, uh, everyone thought he was just a beggar. But Ibn Arabi, through his basira, recognized him as the Qutb al-Zaman, the, the supreme wali of his uh, age. So people uh, can, uh, the real awliya can hide behind very unpresentable appearance. That's why Sufis, this is my last point, I would like to stop here. Uh, uh, Sufis never judge people according to their appearances. They try to see what is inside. Whereas the Salafis, for instance, and other groups, they look at the length of your beard, of, of your trousers, sarawil, uh, because they, they think that 
your compliance with the Sharia is based on the length of your uh, beard, on uh, the shavenness or non-shavenness of your mustaches, on the length of your breeches, uh, which Sufis uh, teach us to ignore. You should look inside. Maybe behind this very humble uh, appearance, there is a, a great saint. So be on your guard. That's what I think Sufis teach us uh, by their knowledge, by their focus on Baatim as opposed to Zahq. In Allah, Akhfa Awliya'ahu fi Aqali Khalqihi, as the hadith also says, Dr. Alexander Nish, thank you for very much for sharing all this interesting knowledge and insight, and thank you for your time. Thank you for interviewing me. It was a pleasure. Um, yeah, please send me uh, a link to the interview when it comes out. Thank you very much.